Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, so glad to see so many faces here. This is really exciting. Uh, welcome to Engaging and Aging, a CLSA question and answer session. Uh, it's really our privilege to have you here today and uh, it, it's, it, it honors us that so many of you have shown up. So thank you very much for your participation. Um, my name is Susan Kirkland. I'm a professor in the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology here at Dalhousie. And I'm also one of the three principal investigators for the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And I have here with me today a number of guests, and uh, both local guests and guests from across the country, uh, who are here to talk to you about the CLSA today, and uh, to, to give you a little bit of a flavor of the kinds of things that we're studying and the kinds of things that we're finding. But I'm, and I'm going to introduce you to them in a sec, but first I'd like to uh, be able to introduce you to them. So maybe you can just tell me for a moment just by raising your hands, how many of you are CLSA participants? Oh my gosh, oh, that's just fabulous. So how many of you are participants who are followed by phone? Oh, fabulous to see. And those of you who come into a data collection center as well? Lovely, fantastic, great. And how many of you are situated in Halifax? Great. And anybody here from outside of Halifax? Oh, fabulous. Welcome. The other thing that I'd like to know is how many of you here are a family member or a spouse of a CLSA participant? Excellent. Wonderful. And thank you for your support as well. That's really great to see. So as you will see from the program, we have a number of presenters and we're going to try and stick to the program, but I'm gonna tell you right now, we'll do our best attempt. Uh, and if, it, if we get a little bit off and you're getting bored, you just get up and move around or do what you need to do. But I promise you, we will leave plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the panelists now. Uh, Dr. Lauren Griffith is here from McMaster. She's an associate professor in the Department of Health Evidence and Impact. And uh, Lauren is also uh, the associate scientific director of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And like me, Lauren has been involved for a very long time in the CLSA. And uh, we're really, really grateful for her participation here today. So welcome, Lauren. And we also have two local investigators who are using the CLSA, but are also CLSA co-investigators as well. So they also contribute to um, the direction of the study. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Yukiko Asada. And Dr. Asada is also in the Department of Community Health and Epidemiology here at Dalhousie. And she co-leads the Halifax site with me of the CLSA. And she does a number of uh, research activities related to the CLSA. So welcome, Yukiko. And lastly, we have Dr. Melissa Andrew. And Melissa is an associate professor of medicine and a consultant at the Geriatric Medicine Unit uh, at the QE2 Health Sciences Center. And Melissa is also a CLSA co-investigator. And she has a, a, a large program of research in uh, dementia and in other, other, of other aspects. She's also uh, very interested in, in sex and gender and health as it relates to aging. And uh, she's going to talk to us today about caregiving. So uh, thank you all for being here. As you know, and I'm not going to get into my thank yous yet, but I would like to be able to introduce you to a number of staff members or who are here with us today. Um, and those of you who come into the data collection site, they're going to be much more familiar to us, to you, than the faces that are up here today. But uh, we have Katerina McIntyre here, who is the manager of the data collection site. She's right over there. And we also have Lindsay McDonald, who is there as well. And I think we have Luke Martelli. Luke is here somewhere. Oh, over there. And uh, we have Sue Nesto with us. 
And also Leah McKenna at the back. Great. And then for those of you who are followed by phone, you don't get the benefit of, of seeing your, the, the person who you're interacting with, but we have uh, William Martin here from the Computer Assisted Caddy site, the Computer Assisted Telephone Interviewing site, which stands for Caddy. So welcome, you can welcome William as well. Um, we also have um, a number of staff at the back who have helped organize this event and work with me on a day-to-day -day basis for the CLSA. So uh, Ashley Ann Marcotte is right there. Kirsty Smith is at the back. And uh, Tim Cron is also here as well. So all of those people are well involved in the CLSA. And if you have any questions that you don't get to answer or you would like to just chat with, they are more than willing to, uh, to talk to you. Uh, what we've also done is saved some time at the end of the program so that you can just ask us any questions that you want. We hope that we will have time to answer all of your questions, but the possibility is that we might not. What I've done, what we've done is on the back of your program, you'll see that there's a space where you can write down questions. You may think of questions as you go along, and uh, you can write them down there, and we'll ask them afterwards. Um, we also are live streaming this event. So right now, there are other people all the way across the country who may be watching, and uh, we welcome the live streamers as well. Uh, and for those of you who are live streamed, I'm sorry we can't accommodate your questions here here right now, but if you send them into the website, we can also develop a question and answer uh, brief for you as well. Uh, before we get started, I just want to give you the logistics. We are going to have a, we're going to have a series of short presentations, I hope. We'll save a couple of minutes after each presentation to maybe ask some specific questions, but then what we'll do is we'll have a little bit of a brief intermission and we'll go into just an open question and answer session. And there are mics that we will be able to rotate around the room for you to ask questions. Uh, the washrooms are out this door and to your right. Uh, we finally do have water at the back of the room, so there's water and there's coffee and tea and there's cookies, so help yourselves. And again, you know, if you wanna get up and walk around, you feel free to do that. Um, I think that's everything I had to say before we get started. Thank you. Great, thank you. So what I'm going to do is give you the sort of backdrop of the CLSA and you know how it came to be and why we decided to do it and then just a little bit of information about you actually. Uh, and then we'll go on and, and we all have both interest in sort of the design and how the studies run, and that's what I'll focus on primarily. And then we also are researchers who are interested in the findings and, and generating findings, and the other presenters will mostly focus on those findings for you. So I wanna just set the stage for you when we think about aging, and aging is a global phenomenon. And this, these are, are what are called population pyramids. And you can see the first pyramid is generated in 1970. The second pyramid is generated in 2015. The third pyramid is what is predicted by 2060. And what you notice is the shape of those pyramids, right? So in, the 19, in 1970, there were a lot of people who were young, and there were very few people who were old. And then in 2015, which is more or less roughly right now, you see that the change, shape of the pyramid, and this is worldwide, is dramatically changing. And by 2060, it doesn't even look like a pyramid at all. And that's really a remarkable shift In Canada, the impact of this is quite severe. And so what we see in this graph right here, and this is, was reported in 2016, and for the first time, these two lines crossed. So the top line that goes down is the number of people who are under the age of 15. And the bottom line that goes up is the number of people who are 65 and older. And for the very first time, those two lines crossed, and all of a sudden, the, the proportion of people who are over 65 in Canada is larger than the proportion of people who are under age 15. And that has an impact on a number of different things, you know, social programs and all kinds of uh, issues. 
There's a number of metaphors that people use about aging demographics. You very often hear people talk about the gray tsunami. And I don't like that term tsunami because when I think about tsunami, I think about damage. And I don't think that what we're here for is damage. <laughs> We also talk about, you know, it's, it's a fast moving train, a hurtling bullet. But I also don't think that's accurate either. And I love this metaphor, which is actually a very maritime metaphor, and it's about the ebb and flow of the tide. And if you think back to those pyramids and the projections, what you see is not that we didn't know it was coming. We, we could see it, we knew it was coming. And what we need to do is prepare, but we also need to understand that this is not for all time. That pyramid is going to continue to shift over, over many, many years. And the point is that we need to understand and be prepared for what that means to our society. In Canada, what it means is that people are living longer. Our life expectancy for women is 83.3 years from birth. And our life expectancy for men is 78.8 years. But what's really interesting, and you don't think about this very often, is if you live to age 65, your life expectancy is actually longer. Because a lot of the life expectancy, a lot of the way that they calculate life expectancy ha counts in, you know, things that you die of at birth or you know the fact that young people die in car accidents and things like that so if you make it to age 65 your life is actually extended beyond the period of birth so women who make it to age 65 can expect to live another 21.6 years or to age 86.6 and men who reach 65 can expect to live another 18.6 years or to 83.5 and so what that means is we really need to think about how we handle this because it's not good enough to just live long. We wanna live well as well. And what that does is it also changes how we think about studying aging. So we really need to get away from just saying, okay, what did somebody die of or did they die? And you know, what diseases do they have? And what's their life expectancy? And really start to think about the things that matter to people. So you know, what's, how, how are people able to function? What's their ability or disability? What are their needs? Uh, how is their well-being? What is their quality of life? How, how are they maintaining autonomy and independence? And those are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about. And those are the kinds of things that we need to be tracking when we're doing research in order to understand what people's needs are and how we can make it a better place for people as they age. And that leads me to the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. So hopefully after I've told you all that, it's a no-brainer that we would need really good, high-quality data where we followed people over time and we understood what the trajectories of aging are like, what, what it means for people to age, where, how critical periods ebb and flow, and really understand those things like function and like quality of life and the things that are really important to people as they age on a day-to-day -day basis. This is a study that is a strategic initiative of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which is our major health funding body in the country. Um, and it is not uh, a single-handed effort. Uh, there are three principal investigators, and you can see the other two principal investigators in that picture. There is Parminder Reyna, who is at McMaster University, and Christina Wolfson, who is at McGill. And the three of us have been responsible for running the study since its initiation. But we also have a large number of co-investigators that we work with. And uh, we work with researchers across 26 universities uh, across the country. And they really do cover all ranges of discipline. Because if you think about it, if you're going to study aging, really what you're studying is life. Like what, doesn't, what don't you want to think about when you're thinking about aging? You want to think about your social health. You want to think about your mental health. You want to think about your physical health. You want to think about your economic health. You want to think about your health services. You want to think about the broad range of of factors that influence you and how those things work together to create the environment and the outcomes that you, that you have.
So really this study was designed with two things in mind. One is to really get at the science of aging and really be at the forefront of the science of aging. And the other was to provide evidence so that policymakers and uh, governments can actually use this information to create good public policy. And the last thing is that there has been a, a real dearth of public health infrastructure and population-based infrastructure in the research community across the country up until now. And the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging really does uh, serve that niche because we've been able to create a national initiative that, uh, that really addresses the health of the population. And I think I'd also like to have you um, be aware as participants that this is one of the largest studies to date in Canada, both for its the numbers, but its depth and its breadth. And it really is um, acquiring a very strong international reputation. So we're really excited about that. But what we realize is that the CLSA is only as strong as its participants. It's really, you know, the high quality information that you give us that we can then use to to translate that into, into science. This is what the structure of the CLSA looks like. And we talked about those of you who were followed by phone. And in our jargon, we call that the tracking group. And then there's the group who come into the data collection site. And we call that the comprehensive group. But the important thing is, is that we have a whole range of the same information on over 50,000 people. And we can really use that in a, in, in a very big way to not just advance science, but change policy as well. For those of you who come into a data collection site, as you know, there's also additional information that gets collected, and again, that really contributes to the science. The CLSA has been funded for, in theory, we always have to go through scientific review in order to get the next slot of funding, but because it has been a... Uh, um, put forward as a, a strategic initiative of the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. It's intended to last until 20, 2033 and cover seven waves of data collection. So as you know, we've finished the baseline data collection, we've finished collection for follow-up one, and we're now partway through follow-up two. And uh, you can see that there are CLSA participants in every province. And those of you who are fo followed by phone are randomly selected to participate within age and sex group within province. And for those of you who are in a comprehensive site, you're selected from a, a specific area around the site so that you can travel to it. But, and you can see the various data collection sites across the country. Uh, I don't need to tell you about the amount of information that we collect because you've experienced it yourself. You know that we collect a wide range of information on uh, socio-demographic factors, health factors, social factors, psychological factors. And we also um, have people come to the data collection site where we collect a lot more clinical information uh, that is used. And you also provide, for those of you who agree, provide blood and urine to us. And I just want you to know that your three tablespoons of blood that you provide actually gets divided up into 42 aliquots that are, are covered in different ways that researchers can use for, for various uh, uh, studies and, and investigation. And if you ever wondered where your biospecimens go, this is where they're stored. They're stored at the Biorepository and Bioanalysis Center at McMaster. And these are uh, nitrogen freezers. And we have 31 of these nitrogen freezers and the capability of storing 5 million samples. The other thing that I'd like to let you know, and I, think, and I hope you know this, is that um, that the, the study is funded as a platform. So that means that the, the information that you provide to us is not just for the CLSA co-investigators, it's made available to the research community across Canada. But it's very important to us that we safeguard your data um, and that we protect your confidentiality at all times. But the data is available to researchers and to trainees to use, and the way in which they, they gain access to it is they have to submit their proposals and be approved by a data and sample access committee and also a university-based ethics committee. 
And we have approved over 200 teams to use the CLSA data to date. So just to give you a snapshot of, of what you all look like, um, the majority of people who are in the CLSA identify as white and were born in Canada and most often speak English at home. 4% self-identify as Indigenous, and that includes North American Indian, Métis, and Inuit. 64% um, state that they, uh, their religion is Christian. 21% uh, say that they have no religion. And 24% attend religious activities on a regular basis. But these are, these are overall statistics. And what becomes really interesting is when you start to break them down and look at them in a little bit more detail. So for example, when it comes to income, um, participants who are in the CLSA are relatively well off in comparison to other, you know, in comparison to the Canadian population. The majority of CLSA participants have a household income of between 50 and $100,000. However, um, there are 6% of the sample who report that their household income is less than $20,000. But if you break it down and you look at various age and sex groups, for example, if you look at women who are aged 75 to 85, that rate is double. So 12% of women who are 75 to, 75 to 85 say that they live on less than $20,000 as a household income. This just gives you an idea, and I don't expect you to be able to see these, and I don't want you to worry about it. If you can't, I'm just going to tell you what's on there. Um, overall, there are a number of people from the Atlantic region. In total, uh, the Atlantic makes up 20% of the sample of the CLSA and almost 11,000 participants. So we're very strong in the Atlantic, and we like to stay that way. Uh, the CLSA includes a number of special interest groups, and these were not uh, specifically designed um, when, we, when we designed the study. It wasn't specifically designed that we could look at this, but what we find is when we have 50,000 people, we get large groups of subpopulations. So we have a large group of veterans who are in the CLSA. We can look at Aboriginal peoples. We have a Francophone pe population. So 20% of the CLSA participants do the CLSA interview in French. We can study some urban groups. We have urban-rural differences where there are people who li are living with a number of different chronic diseases. We have people who are both caregivers and care receivers and uh, a, a large retiree population. When we finished the baseline uh, recruitment and data collection, uh, we worked with the Public Health Agency of Canada to generate a report on the baseline findings. And there, there are some cards made up at the back there that you can go onto the website and look at the actual report. Um, and even if you don't have a card, if you go to the CLSA website, you'll be able to find it. But this was a really um, important time for us. And we actually had a day on the hill with all of the politicians where we released the report. And uh, it was a very uh, big, splashy event. Um, and we hope to be able to do that each time we finish a, a wave of data collection. There's some interesting things, and I'm going to go through them quickly. Um, but I just want to leave you with a few little messages. So not unexpectedly, the, a large proportion of the participants are married. And you can see these bars, and I don't want you to worry about the individual bars, but those dark bars that are the highest bars, that indicates that people are married and the other bars are widowed and separated and divorced. And they're divided out by age group and by sex. And you can see that all of those bars look the same, except one. And guess what? It's women aged 75 to 85. And you see for women aged 75 to 85, the pattern is reversed. By then, you know, a lot of those women are widowed so that you can see that lighter blue bar is the highest proportion. When it comes to retirement status, again, this is broken down by, by uh, sex and also by age group. And all I want you to really notice is the light blue bars are people who are still working. The dark blue bars are people who have retired. And you can see that it's a, 
the proportions are of people who are working are still fairly high until they reach age 65, and then there's a big switch. There's a big flip that occurs. But what's really interesting and what we found is that um, a quarter of people say that they retire for health reasons, but 20% of women and 30% of men actually, we've called it unretire, but at, at some point after they've formally retired, they decide to go back to work either part-time or full-time for, for various reasons. And it'll be really interesting as we follow through that to see what that pattern looks like. Loneliness is a big deal. Um, we're concerned more and more about loneliness. Um, in an age where we're more and more connected, we also experience more and more loneliness. Here, um, the thing that I'd like you to note is again that there's differences by age and sex. So these bars are not very well differentiated, but the green bars are women and the blue bars are men. And so what you'll notice, and the first set of bars is people who are married, the second set of bars is people who are single, the third set of bars is people who are widowed or separated, and the fourth set of bars, oh sorry, the third set of bars is divorced or separated, and the last set of bars is widowed. So for those last three bars, you can see in every group, men are higher. So if you're widowed or you're divorced or you're single or you're separated, men tend to be lonelier than women. But if you look at the first set of bars, which is married, you see an opposite effect. And so you'll see that the highest bars are the green bars. So among people who are married, women are lonelier than men. <laughs> I'm not going to read anything into that at this point. I'm just reporting it. Uh, in these slides, we look at hearing loss and vision loss. And the first group is hearing loss, and the second group is vision loss. And the dark green bars are men, and the light green bars are women. So you can see for hearing, for both women and men, hearing loss increases over time. That's not surprising. But what is surprising is that it's remarkably different between women and men, that it's higher for men in terms of hearing loss. And when you look at vision, you see a different pattern. For vision, it's women who experience more vision loss over time. Uh, again, so this is about activities of daily living, which are, you know, general things that you do in life, like, you know, bathing and eating and the dressing and those kinds of things, and also instrumental activities of daily life, which co cover things like, you know, doing your banking and more complex tasks. And here what we say, see is that when we combine those two things together, that women over time have more difficulty um, in activities of daily living. But one of the things that you have to think about, and especially in the older age groups, is what you get is survivor bias. So you can't have more problems with activities of daily living if you've already died. <laughs> and the people who live are better off. So those are the kinds of things that we have to think about as researchers when we're interpreting these findings. This is a very busy slide, but I, I know that all of you, many of you, are very interested in, in your cognitive function. And some of you are concerned about your cognitive decline. And I hear all the time that you don't like the cognitive component because it makes you feel like you can't remember anything. But if it makes you feel any better, I struggled for two hours yesterday to remember the name of McNabb's Island when I was taking Lauren on a tour. So honestly, it's... Uh, but what's really interesting about this, so these are bars of men and women, and they're by English and French, and what you see is that for both men and women, for both immediate recall and for delayed recall, there's a decrease over time. But what's really interesting is that this is the first time we've ever had this kind of information. We've never really known in a population what normal cognitive decline looks like. And so in a study like the CLSA, we're starting to be able to say, okay, this is what is normal when you age. And I also want to reassure you that these are just two elements of cognitive decline or, or cognition. There's a number of other elements of cognition when in fact we don't see this pattern of decline, when it stays across the board. So 
the CLSA is really doing groundbreaking work in this area. And as much as I know you don't like doing those tests, we really appreciate that you do them because it's telling the world a lot. Uh, my last slide is going to talk about self-rated health and uh, the thing that I want to leave you with here is that participants in the CLSA generally rate their general health and their mental health as very high. And this is something that you know, is, is, is rewarding and it's nice to see, but we were also worried that you know, maybe you guys were just happier than the rest of the world um, or the rest of Canada. So we checked other studies to see. And in fact, no, it's quite consistent across other studies as well that, that um, as people age, they tend to maintain high levels of uh, self-reported general health and also self-reported uh, high levels of of mental health. So I'm going to leave you now and pass it on to uh, our next presenters. But I do want to, again, reinforce that this is not a, a solo effort. Uh, there are many, many people involved, and these are some of the central people involved in the CLSA. Uh, this study is also not a cheap study to run. And uh, we have many partners and many funders. And uh, the key um, Canadian institutions that have funded us are the Canadian Institute for Health Research and the Canada Foundation for Innovation. But the provinces and the universities and private industry has also uh, contributed to this study. And I show this slide every single presentation I give, and it's an acknowledgement and thanks to the CLSA participants. Uh, but I have the honor of thanking you in person today, so thank you. Excellent, and I want to thank you as well and echo everything that Susan said about how much we appreciate all of the, you know, amazing um, willingness to participate and participate over a long period of time because one of the things that we struggle with in longitudinal studies is keeping people in and engaged and it really has been amazing in terms of the number of people who have stayed and keep contributing in a very very um, you know in, in a very important way to to our um, to our study and to our research and again here is today is one of the kind of really exciting times for us because we get to talk about some of our preliminary findings. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some different ways that we've used the same sort of data. So I, I was started it with calling it why so many questions because as you know, there are a lot of questions in the CLSA. But these things really give us important context, but not only that, it also gives us a way to look at the data in multiple ways. So there's all sorts of different lenses that we can look at with, these, with the data that we collect. And so I'm gonna just organize myself a little bit with um, kind of why are we interested in these areas, what information is collected in the CLSA, and then how are the data being used. And I also wanted to acknowledge my co-investigators and my collaborators. Some of the work that I'm going to show today is things that they're, they are actually leading. So I want to acknowledge uh, Alexander Mayhew, Marla Beauchamp, and Aisha Kuspinar. So I'm going to talk a little bit about chronic conditions. And there are a lot of chronic conditions that we ask you about in the CLSA. And I know that, that Susan showed a little bit of the data, but one thing we can see is we can look at the, the proportion of people who have different types of chronic conditions. So for example, the most common one was actually arthritis. So over a third of people reported having arthritis and 16% reported having diabetes. And we can compare these chronic conditions to um, people in, in Canada and around the world. And again, you know, there's all sorts of things that we've looked at. We've looked at, you know, angina, we've looked at dementia, we've looked at migraine headaches. But what we know is most people actually have more than one chronic condition at a time. And that's one of the issues that's very difficult to deal with in our healthcare system that's kind of focused around single conditions. And so one of the areas that I've been studying is multimorbidity. And so one of the biggest reasons that we want to study multimorbidity 
or essentially just having two or more chronic conditions at the same time is that it's associated with a higher risk of death, disability, um, functional status, how we're able to live our lives and our quality of lives. And as well, um, adults with multimorbidity account for about two thirds of the healthcare spending. So it's a very important area of research, but one of the things that we found, and when you think about multimorbidity, it is kind of generic. So you have two or more chronic conditions, but two or more of what list of chronic conditions? And so what we've been able to do with the CLSA data is look at some of these lists of chronic conditions. We've been look, able to look to see what sorts of chronic conditions are included in them. Some of them have, for example, diseases that we're used to seeing, you know, heart disease or diabetes, but some have risk factors like, you know, hypertension or even obesity, and some have symptoms like pain, those sorts of things. And so what we've been able to do with CLSA, because we have all of the comprehensive data, is to actually break these down. And what we found is that the list really matters. When we look at multimorbidity, which kind of makes sense, if you start including things like risk factors, like hypertension, the prevalence goes way up. But when you look at the associations with really important outcomes, the sorts of things that we want to be able to identify, like self-reported health and disability and social participation, it's really not as strong. But when you start including symptoms in these lists, it actually makes a difference. So in terms of this particular study, it was really informative in terms of how these lists should be constructed in terms of doing further research in in multimorbidity, but also about interventions. So starting to understand this better is allowing us to make better interventions. So this is kind of one area where it was very general, or generated this study that really spoke to research. But as some of you know, I know that probably about two thirds said that you're part of the comprehensive cohort. When you come to the data collection site, there's a number of performance tests that you do. So you do the gait speed, so you do a four meter walk, um, a timed up and go, where you kind of get up out of a chair and walk, and a balance, where you stand on one leg, and a chair rise, where you go up and down from the chair a couple of times, and grip strength. So there's these five tests, but they're five, and, and I think you could attest to this, they're fairly simple tests, they don't take a lot of time, but they're also very informative in terms of clinicians wanting to assess things like falls risk. And what's interesting is, again, falls, very, very important. It's the biggest cause of, of injury-related hospitalizations for older adults. And the other part is, you know, you have what you think of the injury in the fall, but there's really this also social and psychological context where many people who fall, develop a fear of falling, start to limit their activities and their social um, connections, and so it can lead to social isolation. So it's really, really important. But what we've found is clinicians like to use these performance measures to, to create fall risk tools, but there really is no agreement in terms of what is the right test to use and what are the right cut points to use. And one of the reasons that there's not this sort of information out there is a lot of these, you know, a lot of these recommendations have been made on very small populations. And so we have these huge heterogeneous populations of older adults where, you know, we can start working on identifying what is the best, or what is the best test to use. Again, they're simple, they don't take a lot of time. And what are the cutoffs that are gonna help us to really inform who can use um, falls interventions? And so these are things that will actually be used. This is work that was um, led by Marla Beauchamp and Ayushay Kuspinar, but these are things that will actually be used in clinical practice as we move along. And this is actually a lot of the data for CLSA is able to be used in this way, and it's very, very important. So just the last bit I wanted to show up, uh, uh, this is um, some of the work that is being led by Alex Mayhew. 
And again, when we think about physical limitations and physical functioning, we have those performance measures. But what we're really interested in, why we want to look at those, is they seem to predict disability. So you have restrictions in performance start to um, impact the way that we live our lives. So here we have the gentleman with the cane who has some sort of physical limitation, but they, he uses an assistive device and a cane. It doesn't mean he necessarily is disabled. It means that he has some sort of limitation. And we hope to, um, to make sure that he's able to live his life and, and do all the sorts of things that we need to do to be, um, to be able to live on our own and be and to be um, autonomous. So when we talk about disability, as Susan alluded to, um, we, we look at these things we call activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So essentially the things that you need to do to live your life autonomously. And what we found is we have, although we measure physical um, functioning differently in the comprehensive cohort, you come in and do your performance measures. In the tracking, we actually ask a number of questions. So we have the five performance measures in tracking, or in comprehensive, but we have these 14 questions in tracking. And they really kind of link on to three main domains. So upper body, lower body, and dexterity. So we have kind of three domains in tracking, and we have these five, um, these five performance measures in comprehensive. But what was really interesting, what we found, is although um, they are measured in a very different way, again, we have another bar chart, but this one is a little bit different. So here, for the comprehensive, it's in blue, and you could see the bars represent people who have one, two, three, four, or five of the, the um, performance measures on which they are um, performing in the, lower, in the lowest quartile, so lower in the performance measures. And so the way you can interpret these bars is compared to people who have none of the performance measures in the lowest quartiles, what is the odds or what is the possibility, what is the chance of having disability? And you can see if you have one, two, three, it increases. The more of these performance measures that, that are um, for which it's, it's a lower level and up to the point where there's five. And what we find, it's in tracking, we have very similar results. If you have one domain, two domains, or three domains where there is impairment, then you're much more likely to have some sort of issues in terms of the activities of, of daily living. So here, at this point, if you have the three of the domains or five of the measures, you're actually over 10% or 10 times higher in terms of your chance of having activities of daily living limitations. So here it's actually, it's interesting because we have a huge amount of data, but we're able to actually find similar results looking at the data in two different ways. So with the questionnaires and with the actual performance measures. So in summary, again, I'm trying to be cognizant of time. I know we're all very excited about the research that we're doing. But again, we owe a great debt to all of the CLSA participants. And the CLSA data are being used by research as well, to, as well as to inform practice, which is, I think, very important, and policy, as Susan was saying. And again, the richness of the CLSA data is really what allows us to look at these things with many lenses, so they can be used in many different ways. And thank you. Okay, um, how is everybody doing okay? It's kind of mid uh, stage, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Yukiko Asada, so um, I'm going to uh, tell you about the, the research I'm doing uh, using CLSA. Um, let me start with the personal story. So I've just came back from Japan, where I'm originally from. And one of the highlights always to go back to Japan is to see my grandmother. Uh, she just turned 92 this month, and she's doing well. But when I think about her, um, her aging, I think about well, whether her knees, basic knees are met, how about her social life, and how about her health. 
And then I think you think about you know, successful aging of yourself, your family, and friends. We can think about successful aging of a population or society as a whole. And when you want to do that, it's not just a single person. There are many people in there. And then there, we need to worry about two things. One is, on average, how we are doing. So like a Susan's presentation, we heard that on, a, on average, people expected to live this year. But then we know that then it's not everybody's experience. They're just a little, this figure. <laughs> All of these people probably have different experience. So we have to also worry about everybody. And this concept of thinking about average and then everybody is not new. And probably the most familiar is the income. This is not the CLSA data, but it's from Statistics Canada data. So in 2011, in Canada, after tax, uh, average income is $44,500. We know that the, this is not everybody has that income. And then here, the top 20% is 87100 bottom 20% is $16,000. So there is a gap. And we worry about those things. And this is not just one way to look at the income gap. For example, when we know that the income is actually, is, uh, has a relationship with a kind of social disadvantage or prestige. So we know that the people with disability tend to have lower income or indigenous population tend to have lower income, we worry about it. So that's an income story, but with my um, colleagues, um, Susan is also in my team for this, um, we think about maybe for health, because you know, we value health. We look at an average health, but everybody's health, then this health inequality can be used as a kind of barometer of a successful aging of a society. So how Canada is aging? Is it successfully aging? And it's, we need to worry about everyone. So that's what we are doing. And the interesting thing about health is that an unlike income, income you can count, it's money, but health is many aspects to it. And then I don't need to tell you that then you have to spend a lot of time to answer a lot of questions for CLSA. So there are many aspects of health. And which one to use? Uh, we decided that then for our purpose, we want to um, focus on overall health. And we found three candidates in the um, CLSA data. So first one is self-rated health. You might remember, this is in general, would you say your health is, and you have five options. Excellent, very good, good, fair, or a fair. And in research, um, a lot of uh, researchers um, put it in, in two different categories, good health and poor health. So this is kind of an interesting subjective measure of you assess your own health and tell us. You might think that then, you know, we might be a bit more objective. So there's an objective measure called a frailty. And the frailty is that researchers try to measure frailty in different ways. But in a one common way to do is developed in this university, actually, by a Dr. Ken Rockwood group. And then it's there, you look at the different aspects of health. So from CLSA, we picked 44 different aspects of health. And then we say, we ask this question, how many of them are deficient? So for example, one of the questions may be related to whether the participant had certain chronic condition, like a cancer or diabetes. And if that person had that answer is yes, then we count is a one deficiency, right? So you can see that then we make that way. And then we make a total. 
then we can say in this frailty index, we can say in that person, what is the percentage of deficiency? And if it is zero, there's no deficiency. If it is one, everything is deficient. And in our research, we know that then, uh, people actually cannot sustain life to have a all deficient but alive. Usually, there's at some point that the needs breaks down so much so that then, uh, it's death. Okay. In our research group, uh, we flipped over this because then, somehow we felt that then, a larger number is better health, is more intuitive to think about it. So we uh, consider that the net percent optimal health. So that zero means an all deficient, one is no deficiency, de deficiency and optimal. One last uh, health measure we used to look at is grip strength. So you might imagine that the grip strength is uh, tend to be stronger among men and a younger person and a larger body size. But if you look among your peers, so meaning that if I compare my grip strength with other female and my age group, which I'm not gonna tell you which age group, <laughs> <laughs> and then also same body size. And if I happen to have strong grip strength than my peers, then I have a better future health prospect. So I'm less likely to die. I'm less likely to have cognitive problem. So this is kind of an interesting study now coming out. It's not what we discovered, it's in other researchers in the world is talking about. So what we can say is that maybe it doesn't matter than how strong you are, you know, but after those things considered, the peer effect, then we can kind of calculate future health predicting grip strength. Meaning that then if you have that, and then if that is strong, then you have a better future health prospect. That's something you might want to have. So we use those and three things um, as the um, health indicator, and we wanted to look at the inequality of it. So what we found, is that then when we look at the different aspect of health, actually we get the different stories about health inequalities. And so I'm gonna show you just one result. As I said earlier, those inequality and distribution can be looked at in many different ways. But then I'm gonna show you about association with income. So how does the health is related to the how much uh, household income people have. So here is the uh, reporting good health. So compared to people in the lowest household income, that is less than $20,000. If people have the uh, 20,000 to 49,000, it's hard to say, but it's like a lowest, next lowest level blue. Um, those people are 1.5 times more likely to report good health. Next income level is the 2.3 times more likely to report good health. And then it goes on and on. So the basic message here is that then if you have more income, you're more likely to report good health. Okay. For um, that frailty, it's the story is quite similar. Compared to the people in the lowest household income, the percentage of the opt optimal health increase in a higher level, right? But when you look at grip strength, we couldn't see much of the difference in the uh, one, two, three. So the, uh, the four bottom uh, differences, those uh, group, income group, they don't see any uh, differences, we can say, for certainty. Only at the very top income level, we can say those people have the future health predicting grip strength. So they are stronger, so they have a better prospect. So these are like, you know, different stories about health inequalities. And uh, we are actually quite surprised about that. 
And then again, we studied out its overall health. We've not even looked at like a cognitive health or a function, physical health. We didn't divide them up. So maybe they're very different stories. So which one to choose? Because and originally I said that I want to use that as a kind of barometer for how successfully aging Canadian society is. And maybe we can use, you know, when we talk about income, GDP, uh, gross domestic product in Canada, it's increasing this year, but income inequality goes up. Isn't it nice to have that same health indicator? Like life expectancy went up, but health inequality went down. You know, so those are the information that we can make, uh, we can use to make a um, health policy for aging society. But in now we are getting a different answers. So here, ultimately, the answer to the question which one to choose is what aspect of health do we wish to distribute fairly in society? So it's not just kind of number game, it's like a what you value. So I find that you know, that's very interesting that you know, I'm doing and those statistical analysis in front of the computer, but it comes down to what means to us. So I would like to finish with this presentation with the picture, smiley picture of the uh, oldest member of my family. <laughs> uh, he's aging well. And then also you, participants. So I hope that then I gave you a little snippet of the your personal information uh, comes to you know, the, the data, but then that comes back to the very important question that then you might answer differently, what you value to distribute fairly, right? And then of course, I'm not doing this alone, it's a, it's a difficult uh, research, and then I'm very grateful for my colleagues, and Susan Kirkland is one of them, and then Jelly Hurley and Michelle Grignon, uh, at McMaster University um, are close collaborators on this project. So thank you very much. Thanks, Yukiko. So let's have a barometer of how everybody's doing. <laughs> yes, you may. Yeah, so the, you can think about for each, oh yeah, sorry. So the, I said that the, to make a frailty index, I used a 44. Let me just pull up this slide, it might be helpful. Okay, uh, how can I do that? Here. Okay. Uh, yeah, here. So I said I used the 44 aspects and why the number became zero and one. Yeah, okay, so could I explain a little bit? Yeah, so you look at the 44. So the, this uh, at the bottom, you see that the, uh, the denominator, so you have 44, right? And then in the numerator side, you have a, uh, how many of 44 you have deficiency? So let's say it's 22 you have deficiency. So 22 over 44 is 0.5. Then you can say 50% deficient. Okay, so that's how we summarized. Sorry if I went too quickly, but is it, does it make sense now? Yeah, okay, thank you. Standing up for a break. Okay, perfect. And please do. Yes, does anybody else feel like going to practice their grip strength now? Yeah. Yes. It's good to practice. Okay, yeah. here. Sure. Yes, uh, so the, this part of research is uh, not my own thinking. 
It's, uh, uh, it's done by the Ken Rockwood, Dr. Ken Rockwood group. So I asked that question. Many people actually asked the question that you know, some aspect of health is more important than the other. And maybe we should wait. We should give uh, more value, more importance to those aspects. And for which I got the answer that the no, that's not the point of this uh, measure. So the, what they are thinking of is, is more like a system kind of understanding. So the, it doesn't really matter. But then you need to look at the more than 30 different aspects of health. And you weight equally. And then somehow we come up with some very interesting result that is in a very, um, it's meaningful when we compare populations across times. It gives us some information about the, how the body is doing underneath. All right. Yeah, there's, it's an interesting question. It comes up a lot. I work with that frailty measure, too. And um, one way to think about it is that it's self-weighting, right? So that if you have bad enough arthritis that also gives you pain and functional deficiencies in other areas, then you get three points instead of just the one. So we're really, um, there's many ways to think about it. Um, Great. So um, thanks so much for the opportunity. Are you getting tired at all? Anybody want to stand up, stretch? We are going to have a break, I think, right after me. So I'll try not to hold you up. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking about another uh, example of a study that we can do with the very rich data that you're providing as part of the CLSA. Um, and um, Yukiko started with a personal story. And I guess my personal story is I found out my mother-in-law is here. So I figured I'd better do a good job. And then I found out that my parents are watching online from PEI. So then I had to dress up, OK? So, <laughs> um, so uh, it's a real great pleasure to be here and to be sharing some of what we're doing. Um, so this is a project that um, I've been working on with um, Susan Kirkland and Christy Smith, who's here as part of the CLSA team. Just one example of many that uh, we can do with your data. So um, I'm going to talk about, we've, so far we've been hearing about the participants themselves and, and health measures. And right now we're going to shift a little bit to thinking about caregiving and relationships with other people. So we'll talk a bit about caregiving um, in the uh, general population in Canada um, and what we found from your baseline data. Um, and also start looking at um, some of the implications or how health or other factors or socioeconomic factors are associated with caregiving amongst CLSA participants. So just as a bit of uh, background, um, in Canada, we think of ourselves as having a, uh, a, a universal health care system and we cover a lot of things, including you know, home care and long-term care. So we think that caregiving is really covered by the system. But those of us who are on the ground, including you, will know that that's not the case. So most care is actually provided outside of the system. We call that informal. That's just one word for it. But it means done by family and friends. Um, as in the people such as yourselves who are participating in our study. Um, and this is really critical because it allows somebody who's receiving care to remain more independent, living in their own home, and not have to, for example, move to a long-term care facility if they don't want to. Um, and so we do know that the experience with caregiving is quite varied, though. So if you just say, are you a caregiver or not, or are you receiving care or not, it it's, doesn't capture um, the richness of the experience. So what we aim to try to do is to try to figure out um, how long are people providing care, like the duration? Is it just short term when somebody has a broken leg, for example, that heals up and then they're, they're not needing that care? Or is it long term for something like dementia, for example, that is, is progressive? Um, and also try to think about the intensity. So how many hours per week, for example? Uh, the person's providing care. And also, do they live with um, the person or not, and what's the relationship? I know from a, a clinical point of view, um, I talk to a lot of people and their caregivers, uh, and there's such a, ver a variety of experiences, you know, whether the person lives uh, with them or whether they have to drive two hours each way to make sure that the person hasn't fallen on the floor, for example, is a really big difference. Um, Okay, so just among um, the, the first, the baseline uh, CLSA, what we found is that um, almost 40% or 4 out of 10 participants are providing care, so are what we would call caregivers. Um, and about 8% are care recipients or receiving care. But th there's some overlap there too. So there's about 6% who are both giving care and receiving care. And I think that's a really important message. We see that all the time, actually. We think sometimes that we think of seniors as receiving care and needing 
a lot of help, but really most of what we see is that seniors are providing support or it goes both directions. So it's really enriching for both parties in, in many cases. Um, when we break it down by who's providing care, receiving care, and both giving and receiving, it is more often women than men. Although there's a good uh, chunk of men who are doing um, a lot of caregiving, so we don't wanna forget about them. So uh, if we look at it by age, I, I suppose not surprisingly, um, there are um, more people, so the care receivers are in the light blue. So there's more people receiving care or that, that increases as people get older. But uh, certainly there's some of our younger participants who are receiving care. Um, and there are many of our oldest participants who are giving care, right? So there's a, there's a trend association with age, but it's not, um, it's not universal. Uh, so we need to think about that. And so a lot of this has, a lot, uh, has relevance for clinical practice. So how do we best support caregivers and care recipients, but also on a policy level, um, how does our government home care, long-term care system support caregivers? Um, so I mentioned that we were gonna be looking at it by intensity too. So we, we have broken uh, it down into different groups. So we have the non-caregivers compared to uh, people who give care or provide care. Um, and then we have low intensity defined as less than five hours a week. Medium intensity is five to 19 and high intensity is more than 20 hours a week. And that actually aligns with some of the um, programs that are in place in the Maritimes where if one is, wants to be eligible for certain supports for caregivers, usually it's for more than 20 hours a week. Um, and then we also looked at the length of time of caregiving. So is it short term, so less than 12 weeks or is it longer term? Um, so the short term is for more of a self-limited condition or someone who's perhaps at the very end of life would be another example, but longer term would be someone who needs a lot of assistance over time. Um, so uh, the slides are a, a little busy, but the idea is to get a visual impact there, right? So the whole CLSA population is the black bar on the top. So that's the 51,000 people. Um, the caregivers, I said, are about four out of 10. So that's the sort of reddish. Um, and then within the caregivers, we can look at short and long term. So it's about half and half. So it's not just short term care that people are providing. Um, and then when we think about intensity, uh, there's a, a fair number of people, over 4,000, who are providing high intensity care. So that's the more than 20 hours per week and over a long period of time. Um, we have an Atlantic Canada. Um, focus uh, with their audience now, today. So um, it's interesting to just look at some differences between the provinces. So Nova Scotia is up at the top, and we have PEI, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, and then Atlantic um, Canada all together. So um, uh, the patterns are roughly similar. So we would see um, it's around 40% in each of the provinces who are um, providing care, although Newfoundland <laughs> is a bit lower than that. Could have to do with age structure and who's there and who's out working somewhere else, for example. Um, and then um, within each uh, of the provinces, it's, it's roughly similar. Um, and then we wanted to look just briefly as a high level overview of how the long term and high intensity caregivers are faring, because those that might be the group that we'd be most concerned about supporting from a policy and clinical care standpoint. So we looked at um, a few different analyses. So one is um, retirement status, um, income, like Yukiko was just talking about, um, relationship to the care recipient, uh, the living situation, and then some measures of satisfaction with life and mental health. So um, caregivers uh, who are doing long-term and high-intensity care are more likely to be retired. Makes sense because they do have the more than 20 hours a week that's required for the, uh, the high-intensity. Um, I, I know uh, we haven't looked at this exactly, but some of the people probably retired in order to be caregivers, which is an important thing to think about when we, when we think about supporting them, them in long term for that choice, which may have an impact on their pensions and in their own uh, uh, socioeconomics into the future. Um, caregivers and income, long-term high-intensity caregivers are more likely to report low income, and that may be, again, part of this um, reverse causation where they've had to cut back on their work in order to do the caring. Um, this is useful from a policy standpoint because uh, in the maritime provinces, at least in Nova Scotia, we do have a caregiver benefit where people can um, apply for and receive financial compensation for caregiving in the high intensity. Um, they used to have one in New Brunswick, they just cut it apparently. I don't know about the PEI situation. 
Um, the relationships of the care recipient, the people who are doing the long-term high-intensity caregiving, not surprisingly, are more likely to be caring for a spouse or partner, so it's about 40% um, than the other groups. Um, and they're also more likely to be living with uh, the, re the care recipient, so that's about 60% of them are living together, um, which kind of makes sense. They're there to be able to provide that, that intensity of care. Uh, it's interesting, though, that um, many of them aren't. So uh, the other 40% are not living together, but yet they're still trying to provide that um, degree of care. Um, and then uh, getting to the depression and mental health, uh, I, I like to think about it in the flip side first to say that most caregivers are doing well with their mental health. They're not having depressive symptoms. A minority are, and unfortunately, it's the people who are doing the long-term high-intensity caregiving who tend to have more of a hit to their mental health based on what we've seen in these analyses. Um, and satisfaction with life is similar. So um, like, like we've heard, as people get older, they tend to report better satisfaction with life, and that's one of the reasons I love working in geriatrics. Um, but uh, we do find a minority people who are having uh, more struggles in that domain, and, and it is more likely that the people who have long-term high-intensity caregiving are struggling in that way than uh, the other people who are doing less intense caregiving. So that's really all I wanted to say for now. Just a brief high-level uh, example of one of the ways that your uh, data is being used, and we're planning to carry this forward into the future, including to try to inform policy and clinical practice, as we've said. So thank you for your attention. I see there's a question. That's a great question. So the, the question is, what counts as caregiving? And an example is, uh, does it have to be face-to-face? -face? Um, and in, in many cases, to qualify for the benefits, it, it does have to be face-to-face, -face, and then the person who's receiving the care has to have a certain degree of dependence um, and need for assistance, maybe cognitive impairment, that type of thing. But the question is, well, what about um, other types of care? So like looking after somebody's house if they're in the hospital for a long term, um, making sure their pets are cared for, home maintenance. Um, so these are all really important pieces of caregiving. And uh, it is very true that our systems, the formal supports, um, don't do as well across all the different levels or all the different domains. But that is something that we need to be thinking of. And so uh, that type of question, hopefully, we'll be able to look at. Um, you know, maybe not that specific one. Depends what we have in your questionnaires. But that's the type of thing that we really need more information on, definitely. Yeah, so the question is, is it, is it about being a volunteer neighbor? Um, and uh, the, being a caregiver, you can have different relationships with the care recipient. Usually there um, is some sort of relationship, um, but uh, it, I'm, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised over the years of how many caring neighbors actually do so much for people to help um, keep them independent in their communities. So, so uh, volunteers and neighbors are a critical piece of the puzzle too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. Yes, uh, I would say that it is. Now, um, the, for programs uh, with the, you know, the different levels of government, some, sometimes they'll have different uh, definitions. Of, so it would be more if the person is uh, 
an adult, so not a child, or a child with disabilities, they would tend to count it more for access to programs. But in terms of what we're talking about, what matters to us, yes, that would be caregiving, yeah. Because that's certainly something that uh, has impacted your life um, in, in important ways. Yeah. Okay, everyone, it appears that there's no shortage of questions. So what I would like to do now is bring us back in a formal way and um, start to uh, ask some of these questions and hear answers from all of us. So if I could ask you to take your seats again. And um, what I... What I would like to say is if you don't want to ask your question in public, you do have the sheets with you. you feel free to drop off your questions at the back. We can answer them for you and we'll put them on the website. Um, the other thing is if you want to put your personal email address on there, that's fine. Um, I can't promise that I will respond to you individually in a short period of time, but you know, uh, we will respond to you in some way. Um, but I would encourage you, if you have a question, to ask it in the public sphere, because usually what I find is that if one person has a question, at least 10 people have that same question. And it's always really good to have them uh, answered in public. I would also like to uh, bring uh, Katerina McIntyre and William Martin up to the stage. Uh, as I said to you before, Kat is uh, the manager of the data collection site and William is the manager of the computer assisted telephone interviewing site. And you might have questions specifically for them as well. And the other thing that I'd like to say is that when I was uh, pointing out all of the staff that was here, I forgot Nick Didkowski. So, Nick is with us as well, so please acknowledge him. Uh, we do have microphones, so if you want to put up your hand, we'll run to you with a microphone, and then we'll respond with a microphone answer on this end. Okay. Here's our, here's our microphone. Is it working? We've all got microphones, but I don't... Can you hear me? Okay, so if you have a question, put your hand up high. Somebody will come to you with a microphone, and I see someone with a microphone now. Hi. Hi. Um, you've referred a couple of times to the importance of income and uh, how it relates to health outcomes. And, uh, but what early on you mentioned that uh, with this study, that the income appeared at least to me to be kind of skewed to the high end. Does that pose a problem when you're analyzing your data? It's a really good question. Thank you. Um, this is typical of all studies, um, is that the people who tend to respond do tend to have a higher income than the general population. The advantage of the CLSA is that um, you couldn't, not anybody could just participate you were asked to, invited to participate. And so you were specifically chosen within an age and sex range within your province so that, and, and we knew where you came from, so we can then use you as one individual to scale you up to the general population. And that's a really big deal, to be able to wait to the general population to make uh, the inferences that we make representative. But there is a caveat, and that is we can never fully overcome some of those deficits where you're not equal to the general population. One of the things that we did is when we were uh, recruiting people, at about three quarters of the way along, we looked at the data and we said, okay, this is you know uh, a group who's very well educated, and this is a group who is uh, has a high income, and so we specifically looked for low-income postal code categories, and we targeted our, our last recruitment there. And you'll notice that we have actually over 50,000 people in the study, and that's because we were trying to beef up the numbers at the end in the lower-income group. But we've never been able to completely even it out, and the way that we get around it is by making very clear when we make inferences that there are these limitations. Um, and making sure that we uh, also reference it to other population-based studies. Could I add? Um, 
So, yes, it's a very important uh, point, and then uh, Susan's uh, uh, response to how CLSA compares to general population is an important one. But the other aspect of it is that uh, it used to be we thought that uh, poverty is the problem. So if you're not in poverty, you should be fine. But the recent studies, including the ones I showed you, is that uh, it's not just the bottom income or income sufficiency, but it looks like a relationship is graded. It's like a rudder. If you have a little bit more income, your health is a little bit better. And a little bit income, health is an even farther better. So that gradation is a kind of a consistent findings we saw in CLSA except the grip strings. But in a, um, I, you know, it, that's what we are finding. So that, you know, that pose a very important policy question that you know, we cannot just uh, worry about whether people have enough sufficient above poverty income, but you know, it's the distribution of income that might matter. Okay, I'm gonna put more microphones out in the field. Do I ask? Please do. Okay, I noticed that this study says from 65 to 85. Now I'm going to be 85 in August, so does that mean I'm finished? <laughs> you, don't, you don't need me anymore? <laughs> Great question. You think you're gonna get off the hook that easily? No way. So, so when we were designing the CLSA, it was really interesting because we looked at all of the studies that had been done worldwide. And what we found is that the majority of studies looked at people who were over the age of 65. And what happens when you do that is um, you are already, and no offense, and I don't mean to, do, to say that people who are over the age of 65 are old, because I don't mean to say that. Uh, but, but what happens is you're only, getting lo you're only looking at a truncated point in life. And what we thought was really important is to look at the trajectory of aging and to understand the factors that impact how you end up as an older adult and really look at the things that go occur. And if we had our way, we would go right back to birth, but we stopped at midlife. So, so we recruited people who were 45 to 85 at the baseline. And we will follow people for 20 years or until death. And we will follow you uh, even if you become uh, cognitively incompetent if you choose. And so that's how many of you have been asked, once you reach age 70, we ask you if you would be willing to identify a proxy in the event that you are no longer to, able to participate on your own. And we ask you to tell us how you would like to participate in the future if you're no longer able to do it on your own. And we ask you to identify who you might like to have be the person who answers questions for you. So we're really interested in being able to follow you for as long as possible. The, the real disadvantage in studies of aging is the important things that happen, happen to you, you know, the outcomes happen at the end of life. We're following all of the things that are gonna impact that outcome. And the sad thing is if, if we don't actually get to understand what that outcome is, if we lose you before that outcome, because then, then we lose really valuable and important information. So that's why it's so important to us that you stay in the study and you stay in the study as long as possible. Thanks. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, my question is probably most uh, best directed to uh, Dr. Griffith. Uh, but I have a, a small preliminary question, which would make it easier. Do you know about the adverse childhood experiences study? I do not. Okay. Well, I'll just uh, but I, explain I that very, about... very simply. Yeah. Um, this was a study done in the 1990s by the Kaiser Permanente on over 17,000 uh, people. And they looked at 10 adverse childhood experiences that they uh, experienced. I'm not going to give you all 10. I know them, but that's not what, what's relevant. What's relevant is that 
the, by increasing number, not frequency of an experience, but by increasing numbers of these, you ended up with a histogram that very clearly showed that more number of adverse experiences were associated with more comorbidity, comorbidities and earlier death with diseases, behaviors that affected health and disorders. Now, what I'm aware of in uh, one of the uh, more recent questionnaires is that some of those questions started to appear on it. Now, I admit I prompted it because I wrote a letter and said, you've got a wonderful opportunity here to kind of duplicate that information and look at how, what's the role of adverse childhood experiences in the health of, the, of your longitudinal sample. And you did ask some of that, and I'm wondering if anyone has reviewed that yet. Well, it's a good question, and it's actually, it's, it was very exciting because so far, all of the research that we've been able to do is on the baseline CLSA data. And as you say, this was asked of the first follow-up. And so those data are now available as of June the 1st. And so I, I find that completely fascinating. I wasn't aware of the study, but I know exactly um, of the whole life course approach to looking at some of these things. And, and I think it's absolutely relevant and it is something that we will, we will absolutely do. I know there's a number of outcomes that, that are related to that. And, and again, that's one of the really interesting things with the CLSA is that we can look at a number, look at this with a number of different lenses. And in terms of asking it a little bit later, and Susan can probably speak to this as well, it was really difficult to figure out what content to include because we wanted to have as much breadth as possible. And one of the things that we introduced, and there's a couple of, I think, historical items that were introduced at follow-up one because that was something that we thought once people are in and then we have maybe a bit more time because some of the demographic things we don't have to ask again, then we can ask some of these historical things. So in terms of using these data, I think there definitely are people, myself included, that are interested in using the, the um, it's called the Childhood Maltreatment um, uh, Survey and it's a StatsCan one that was developed by a number of people in, um, who, are, who are working with CLSA. So, to absolutely. Give this study a chance to contribute to the mental health of children at the same time as its connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, at the back. Oh, sorry. Oh. Many of us give blood to you people, and the number 42 was mentioned earlier. Could you indicate something of the use to which you put it? And would it be possible at some stage to make the numbers? known to us, the participants, so that we can compare with whatever the numbers showed earlier. I realized that it wouldn't be appropriate for all 42, but possibly for some of the numbers, it might be interesting for us to see how we are progressing or not. Thank you. That's a very interesting question. So, um, you know, collecting blood and urine was something that we uh, really wanted to do, but we were worried about doing it. Um, and uh, we have been reassured by you and by uh, your response to it. So what we do with that blood and urine is there's a number of analyses that we do right on site and they're, they're basic hematology markers. And we have about 10 of those and those are available for use right away. Then what we have is another 30,000 where we have um, a chemistry panel done. And those are things like cholesterol and uh, uh, like ALT and a number of markers, uh, body markers. Then there's um, a number of genetic studies that we're doing. And, and this is why the 42 aliquots were collected and why they were collected in different ways because each type of analysis requires the, that the blood is, is stored in a different kind of medium. Um, and so now we're in the process of doing um, what's called a, a genetic-wide analysis study, or GWAS, with your genetic data. And we've done the first 10,000, and we will eventually do all 30,000. 
We've also done, we are also doing metabolomics, which looks at, at metabolites, and we're also doing epigenetics. So these are really um, new forms of using genetic data. Uh, the reason why we didn't talk about them today is because those data have not yet been released to researchers. Um, the, the, the genetic data, the GWAS data, on the first 10,000 has been released as of June the 1st. And we will start to see some of the genetic findings coming out. Now, one of you, and we will hopefully be able to provide you with some of the biochemistry markers back to you. But one of the things that we've said is that, you know, we really will not give you your individual genetic information back at this point. And the reason is because there's nothing that you can do with it. And it may just, it, 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 and it's collected for research purposes and it's meant on uh, a population-wide basis. Um, and, uh, you know, until, until there is something, in, like there's no point in telling you that you have a genetic disease that you cannot do anything about, or you have a marker for a genetic disease that you cannot do anything about. One of the, one of the facets that we've said is that we had to make decisions about what information we would t return to you. And yes, that information is your own property, but here's the thing, we've said, if it is something that is actionable, we will give it back to you. If there's something that has population-based norms so that we can tell you where your result fits in relation to the population, we'll give it back to you. And we'll give it back to you if it's feasible for us to give it back to you without increasing the cost of the study dramatically. So it's not like we're trying to withhold things from you, but um, there are things that we don't feel are... Um, they're not they're not used on a clinically in a clinically diagnosable way. Thank you. What, uh, what was the uh, received a form there about two weeks ago that I filled out for different information to be shared with my medical community? What, what was that about? Yeah. Yeah. Asking for a further release of your Okay, so so if you remember, when you first joined the study and there was a consent form, we asked you if you would be interested in having us be able to link to your to the data that's collected from you on an administrative basis by the province. So the province collects information on, you know, the number of times you've been hospitalized, what you were hospitalized for, how many times you went to the physician, whether you saw a specialist. It's not your personal medical records, it's just administrative medical records. And when we asked you that, it was at the beginning of the study and we asked you if from the time you entered the study, could we collect that information? Okay, I, I remember that. Yeah, and so now what happened is, it's really hard to access that information by the province. And we have to go to every single province and get permission from every single province. And every single province has to agree. And we're not allowed to cross jurisdictions, so we can never put it all together and look at it in a national study. But there is an institute that collects hospitalizations across the country, and it's called CAIHI, the Canadian in Institute for Health Information. And they have national level data on hospitalizations. And so we said, okay, well that makes sense. Let's go to one organization and get this data rather than trying to deal with all 10 provinces. But when we went to the national organization, they said, great. But then their legal team looked at it and said, no, you can't do it because you didn't, at, you didn't get permission from the participants to get the national level data. So what we decided to do is come back to you and ask two things. One is could we also add in CAIHI, which is a national level organization, to get the data from. And also we asked to go back 10 years from the start. Because if you think about it, and it's like the same, the same rationale as starting in you know, midlife and following you through to old age, there's a lot of things 
that happen in your health records that could actually help us answer some outcomes right now, rather than waiting 10 or 20 years into the future. So if we can go back 10 years, it'll help us see the pattern and the health trajectory and be able to get research out more quickly. So that was the reason for coming back to you for those two things. It's protected in exactly the same way. So we never release your health card number to anybody. And um, even when we try to link with these various databases, you should see the rigmarole that we have to go through. <laughs> we have to, it's very complex. But we never release that data to individual researchers, ever. Actually, it, it's a great question, but when we, because we need to contact you, of course, to, to invite you back to the study, but the actual contact information, any identifying information is actually in a physically different location than the data that is distributed to researchers. So only de-identify, we're very, very careful about that, and, and in terms of these linkage sorts of things, the link, all the information that would be used to be linked is actually in a separate place. We have a question over here. Hi. Hi. Scattered throughout the uh, presentations today, I saw two words, right, and I didn't really get a definition of the two words, right? One was successful and the other one was unsuccessful. Successful aging versus unsuccessful aging. So unsuccessful aging, in my estimation, is dying before 65. Successful aging is living beyond 65. So, so far I'm successful, which is a good thing. <laughs> I'm on the right side of the grass, right? But no, really, with all the data you've got and everything you're looking at and salaries and everything else, I'd be curious to see what your definition as researchers are as successful versus unsuccessful. Oh, you ask such a good question. She paid you to ask. So here's the thing, again, when we were designing the study, we looked at the literature, and there's a number of terms that are used in the literature. People use successful aging, they use healthy aging, they use optimal aging, they use productive aging, and they mean different things. But ultimately, we thought about this long and hard, and if you talk about successful aging, as you say, the opposite is unsuccessful aging, and it sounds like a judgment call. It sounds like you're being judged about, you know, whether you've aged all right or not. And we really didn't like that term because people can age in various ways, and you can have a disability and still age well. Uh, you can have some kind of disadvantage and overcome it. People adapt all the time, and that's the biggest thing that uh, we're interested in learning about aging, is how people adapt to the circumstances that they find themselves in. So generally, we shy away from using the term successful aging, but not always. There's sometimes when it it's, you know, gets the point across quickly. Um, but we tend to talk about healthy aging. And when we talk about healthy aging, we do not mean simply physical health. We're talking about physical, social, psychological health, and the broad spectrum of things that go into uh, making up your overall health. But What's really interesting in the study that I'm doing, which I think is absolutely fascinating, is you know that we've asked you this open-ended question about what does healthy aging mean to you? And it's really interesting because we thought it was, it's the only question that's, you know, not scripted. Everything else, you know, we tick off a box. But in that question, we write down verbatim everything you say. But what's really interesting is that then it becomes really hard to use that information. Because it's not qualitative information, it's not quantitative information. There's 50,000 responses and we've looked at it and you know the shortest response is one word and the longest response is 312 words. And how do you make sense of that? But what we said to our what we said is 
The whole reason we ask that is because we, you know, we're always willing to stand up here as researchers and say, what do you think healthy aging is? But why don't we ask the people who have lived experience and understand healthy aging from their perspective? So what we're now doing, I have a team uh, working with some computer scientists, and we're looking at um, ways in which we can use all of this data to come up with lay definitions or you know population based definitions of healthy aging and we're we're right in the thick of it we're using what's called um, natural language processing and machine learning techniques to try and uh, make use of that very interesting data and we'll certainly report it back out to you yes yeah I have a <clears throat> excuse me I have a question uh, the woman in the front kind of made me think about a question. She basically said, like, you know, once I'm 85, am I done? So my question is, you said the end point is 2033, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so it makes me think back to, you know, years ago in paramedic school, I had to learn about the Framingham Heart Study. It was just boring stuff I just thought I had to learn to get through my part of my courses. But it makes me realize, you know, that started like well over, I think last year, it celebrated its 70th birthday. And uh, it, my question is, with the end point, uh, with this program, the study, like with the Framingham Heart Study, it was long enough for 70 years, they said like in the 60s, we understand how cigarette smoking affected cardiac health. In the 80s, we understand how uh, cholesterol affects it. And in the, in the aughts, they started to understand better how like blood pressure affects cardiac health. I guess my question is, is a longitudinal study long enough? Do you, do you, are you confident it'll be long enough so that these things will actually trickle down to the general population, become like common knowledge. People today know you shouldn't smoke, it's bad for you. Watch your cholesterol, it's bad for you. you know, watch your blood pressure, it's bad for you. Are you guys confident enough that this will be longitudinal enough that it'll trickle down to the general population and this will become common, common things that people will accept how you should watch your health and well-being? Well, here's a secret. <laughs> We don't intend to end the study in 2033. <laughs> we haven't told our funders yet that in so many words, but, but what we intend to do is demonstrate the value of this study. And by 2033, I think they will understand quite clearly that that by ending the study now, it will be a significant loss to Canadians. And I'm hoping that it won't be hard to make the argument at that point. You know, it's really interesting because um, when we go and present our study internationally, people are amazed. And they're amazed for a number of different reasons. They're amazed at the quality of the information that we collect. They're amazed at the way we collect it because it's completely standardized. Right the way across the country, every single one of you completes exactly the same questionnaire in exactly the same way. It's totally standardized. It's very, very high caliber study. And the other thing that we hear is even those studies like Framingham that have gone on for, you know, 70 plus years or, you know, the, the birth cohort studies that have gone on in Europe, they've never been funded for any longer than five years at a time. And they've had to, you know, they've never known that the funding was going to continue and they've had to reapply for funding every single time. And when we tell them that 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 the CIHR has adopted this as a strategic initiative and essentially set aside money for a long period of time. Now we have to make sure, we have to go through international review and you know, submit a new protocol and it has to be approved and you know, to get the funding. But the fact that, that there was some foresight to understand that this was a study that needed to be funding in the long, funded in the long term is actually quite unique. And uh, I forgot that we're on a webcast, but <laughs> I guess the secret's out. Thank you very much. Um, I think my question is a little bit of a follow-on, but maybe refining it. Uh, you are in a study that's been going on for about 10 years. I recognize tonight that I have statistically got another 15 years to go, and you, you may not have uh, drawn any conclusions, but for those of us with that statistical opportunity, are there factors that the 85 and 95-year-olds are now telling you 
then that have reached the um, physically fit, mentally fit age, both of that, that could be useful to people who are in our early 70s to start zeroing in on things that will increase that statistical chance. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. We haven't actually done that yet, but there are a number of studies who have sort of, you know, put people into quartiles, let's say. And again, how you define what successful is, you know, varies from, you know, thinker to thinker. Um, but people have looked at quartiles and said, okay, you know, for the people who are in the highest quartile, what does life look like for them? What does that trajectory look like for them? And how does it differ from the trajectories of others? And that's certainly something we can do in the CLSA. No, there's no data because that's that's the kind of thing that really requires a little bit more of a longitudinal approach. Uh, about a year ago, um, I heard a, a Dalhousie doctor state in a social situation that according to him, there were two things that governed your longevity. One was your genetics, your genes, and the other one was the amount of stress you were under. And he said, I don't care how many vitamins you take, or how much you exercise, if you're under stress, you're gonna go before your time. Is stress part of your study? <laughs> uh, yes, there's a number of questions that get at stress. Um, but, but stress is a very elusive thing to measure, to be perfectly honest. It's a very difficult thing to measure. So we look at, you know, we look at, um, in, in the way in which the questions are asked can be combined in numerous ways to get at stress. So, you know, we understand about, you know, family relationships, we understand about income, we understand about uh, chronic conditions. We do have um, scales that talk about distress. We have scales that get at anxiety and depression. Um, and, uh, you know, we have scales that look at sleep, which is also a very important indicator. No, that's not part of the 44 factors. Well, they go into the 44 factors, but we can also look at them in a different context. So um, I would be very surprised if researchers don't take up uh, looking at some of those stress factors. And the interplay. And, you know, stress is one aspect, but there's, you know, it's the interplay between genes and environment. And when I, when I say environment, it's genes and everything else, basically. But it's really the interplay between those two that, um, that is important. Thank you. I'll add something on that topic. I don't know if this is turned on. Um, uh, as another example of a project we're working on, we've taken the work on the frailty index that Yukiko was talking about, measuring up the number of deficits or health and functional problems somebody has, and then we have another index measure of people's social circumstances and social vulnerability, so it's like a whole bunch of social related factors from income and housing to do you feel lonely, um, isolated, how do you feel about your life in those social ways. But then we're adding in a third one, which is about resilience factors and, and health and protective behaviors. Um, and so we're trying to tease out the differences between you know, your health and your function is one thing, and then what your social situation is is another thing, and then how do you be resilient. So I think in the coming years, you will see more information coming out of the CLSA about that. Yes. We're great. All right, I'm going to thank you for this because it's fun to put a face on your on the on these people on the phone that call me. <laughs> Ridiculous goddamn question. Look at them. Don't look at me. <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm fine. I don't believe you. But anyway, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Thank yes. you very much. I wanted to ask a question um, pertaining to alcohol use and uh, cannabis use or non-medicated use. Um, 
of um, different things. I always, I'm not originally from Nova Scotia, but I've been here for most of my life. But I always felt that Nova Scotians really like to drink. <laughs> and I didn't realize when the cannabis came out uh, last October that we also were going to get a rating uh, uh, very high in the use of cannabis compared to the rest of the ratio compared. Is that something you look at as part, I, I think there's a question or somebody asked me that at some point, but is that something you're finding out that pertains more so to uh, this group, maybe not so much then or, yeah. Thank yeah, you. It's an interesting question and there's a, there's a, a very interesting sort of west to east gradient around health behaviors in general in Canada. And uh, sadly, because we're the east, we're on the wrong side of the gradient. It's just because we live on the east coast. Um, but w what we have done is look at the alcohol um, variable. And alcohol in the CLSA is a very interesting variable. And it doesn't work the way it usually does. In general, and this is not for the Atlantic region, this is for all Canadians, the more you drink, the better off your health is. <laughs> That's what it shows in the data. I, I don't know what to say. We're a little bit flummoxed, but right now we're gonna, until we break that down a little bit further and understand it a little bit better, that's what, that's what the data shows. Um, Maybe all the socializing that goes with the drinking. Absolutely. And the exercising and getting out. We haven't, uh, we have not yet asked about cannabis use, but I suspect that that will be on the next questionnaire. How did you come up with the number 50,000? Why not 100,000, for instance? Why not which number? 100,000 participants. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. When we were designing this study, we had, you know, we had the Cadillac version, and we had the Saturn version, and we had the Volkswagen version. And the, the Cadillac version had more than 100,000 people in it. Uh, ultimately, what we, where we landed on 50,000 was because we wanted to be able to study everybody across the country, and that was the 20,000 that we follow by phone because we're not limited to having them within a data, act, uh, um, uh, data collection site. But, but really where, the, where we're going to make groundbreaking breaking research is with um, all of the additional clinical and physical and genetic information combined with the very rich information on social and physical and, and uh, mental health. Um, and so we looked at the various endpoints that we would be interested in, and some of them had to do with um, you know, function, and some of them had to do with disease, and some of them had to do with whether you were institutionalized or not. And it really it came down to we, we didn't have the power, the statistical power, to do everything, um, but we could get enough statistical power with 50,000, and uh, we just had to make that decision because of the funding that you know we had to end up negotiating. Um, although it seems like the CLSA is a very expensive study, it's one of the it's one of the most uh, <sighs> efficient studies in the world. Most studies, if you look at the per dollar cost per participant, is much, much higher. Uh, yeah, good value for money. We did not have a hard time getting 50,000. We, we, um, it took us a long time to get 50,000 just because we were, and, and it was interesting because the way that the, re the funding works, it was really strange. So, so we got the, the funding to operate the study from the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. But we got the infrastructure, like the building and all the equipment, from the Canada Foundation for Innovation. And the two organizations aren't linked. So we got the funding for, for, to operate the study first, 
but we didn't have the infrastructure funding. So we had to, you know, say, hang on and get the funding for the infrastructure, get the infrastructure built, and then get the study going. So that was what caused the delay in the initial part. We started off early with the people who we could by phone, and we had to wait till all the building was finished before we could bring in the, the um, comprehensive group. Yes? That's a great question. No, it is not automatically destroyed. Um, what happens is when you turn 70, you will be asked some specific questions and we'll come to you and we'll say, um, there could be a point in the future when you may no longer be able to participate on your own, whether it's because you, you are no longer cognitively able to answer the questions, or there may be some other health circumstances. And in that case, what would you like to have happen? And there, you can tell us how you would like to participate in the future if you're not able to. And if you would like to participate in certain, if you would like to continue to keep participating, then we ask you to identify a proxy. And the proxy is somebody who can make decisions on your behalf and can, who, who can answer at questions on your behalf. And then when you get to that point, we just switch over and the proxy continues. You do have the option to withdraw at any point, and there are a number of withdrawal options. Um, but here's the thing. A longitudinal study is only good if we can look at the data longitudinally. So for us, if you stay in the study for 20 years and then you withdraw and we have to withdraw your data, that's a major failure for us. But also too, because we release the data to researchers over time, we actually can't destroy your previous data. It's already been used. So that is something that you know needs to be understood when people are in the study is that it's almost impossible to destroy longitudinal data. Got a question over here. Oh, yes, sorry. I will say something about the decedent interview. So, um, so if a person dies, um, what we will do is we have what's called a decedent interview. So we will either go to the person that you've identified as your proxy, or we will go to somebody who is your next of kin that is in the database. And we will ask them if they would be interested in completing the decedent questionnaire. And what it, will, what it asks is about the things that happened to you over the last year of your life. And it asks about your use of health services. It asks about you know whether you died quickly, you know, or if it was a, a long trajectory, the type of, of um, uh, death you had. And it also asks uh, some issues around quality of death and dying, and, you know, whether you died in, whether they think you died in the way that you wanted to die. And it also does ask now about medically assisted death. Yes. Hi. Um, as the candidates, um, basically the population die off. Are you going to add new people for this study if it goes for the longer run? That's also a great question. Um, we haven't made that decision yet. Um, once we're midway, I think, so here's one of the things that's happened, is not as many people have dropped out of the study as we thought. We, you know, we had to develop a trajectory of what we thought how people were going to drop out of the study over time. And more of you have stayed in the study than we thought. It's actually got a real impact on our budget. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, it's, it's, a, it's a good problem to have. However, there is discussion about having what's known as a panel, where at some point we would replenish the people that we've lost, either through attrition or through death. Okay. It's under discussion. Okay, and the other one is just a curiosity question. Why do you think higher income people live longer? Oh, that's a very good question. I'm passing that to you, Kiko. <laughs> there are different theories. Um, 
One is about materials. So about you have house, you have all the means you need, you can eat well, and all those kind of things. Other theories talk about psychosocial issues. So the, uh, it's not that you, you're suffering those uh, material things, but in, just because you compare yourself to someone who has more, and that relates to earlier question of stress, that then maybe that is causing certain stress. And that psychosocial thing is really interesting. It's not just humans. There are interesting studies about vulnerables. And so, you know, high alpha male and uh, low ranking bono, uh, the vulnerables and, and how it goes. And then, so the, it's chimpanzees and then we have those uh, things. But then it's very complicated. It's not just that it's better if you're on the top, but then it's actually depending on what kind of society you live. And then if it is, uh, you know, the values more cooperation, then that's not better to be in a top ranking and all those kind of things. So uh, the short answer is, is we don't know. But uh, there's uh, just like uh, when we talk about aging and then health, it's not just one thing. There are many things that comes into. And then so that relationship with an income and health is also very multifaceted. I'm aware that we're beyond our time. and. Um, I'm happy to continue to answer questions, but I do want to say to those of you who want to leave or need to leave, please do free to, feel free to get up. But before we do that, I would just like to really acknowledge your participation and thank you so much for being here with us today. If you still have questions, we're still here to answer them. Yes, at the back. Um, we, we are asked questions to determine our cognitive skills, and we're asked pretty close to the same questions the next time we're interviewed. And I think there may be a little learning curve there. I know that I'm better now at uh, uh, listing off a number of words that start with a, a certain letter in the alphabet than I was the first time I attended one of your uh, get-togethers. You're practicing. <laughs> you well, know what? Well, it's just natural. Do it you, is natural, and if you think you're the only one that's doing it, you're wrong. <laughs> do you think that that is causing a bias in the reduction in cognitive skill over time? Uh, no. Actually, it does cause a bias, but we're aware of the bias. <laughs> so we can Very compensate good. for it. Yes, understood. What, one other thing, the, the four to four factors. Um, is there any weighting put on those at all? Because... Uh, I'm sure that they're not all equal. But here's the thing, and this is, this is the basis of this approach, is if you take those 44 factors that come from the, your system wide, it's not, about, it's not about what they are, it's about the number. And it, because a lot of them are small subclinical factors. They don't show up, they won't show up, you know, in a day-to-day -day basis, but we'll look at, and there's all kinds of little things that go into it. And what we found over and over and over again is it doesn't matter which ones are in there. It's the number that counts. Yeah, but some of them may have five times the, the, the response, the, the, the value. The, but we've looked at it over and over and over again, and it does not matter. We can, we can so we can take 100 factors, and we can randomly select 25, 10 different times. And we can predict, we can look at how they relate to mortality, how they relate to hospitalization, how they relate to institutionalization. And they predict exactly the same way every single time. It's just the number. So the statistics smooth it out. Yeah. It's very cool, actually. There's a lot of math and even theoretical physics and now machine learning that goes into it. And uh, the replication has been so powerful. One thing uh, also to think about is, 
when a lot of the risk scores, when they go to weight things, like to say, you know, like cancer counts as 3.2 and like um, a broken leg counts as 0 0.8 or whatever. Yeah. It's just very specific to that one study that they found those numbers and then you go to try to generalize it somewhere else and it doesn't work as well. So mm -hmm. what we have found is, uh, and it's well supported by the math and the physics, that it doesn't need to be weighted. And it also okay. does the self-weighting, as I talked about earlier, where if you have a really severe illness, say a cancer or something, you get the point for the cancer, but you also get the point for the pain, the shortness of breath, the low mood, and yeah. the functional impact. So it yeah. self-weights in that way yeah. for things that have a big impact on multiple domains. So if you have one factor, you're probably going to have four this is more it. anyway yeah. Yeah. associated with it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much all, and uh, please do take time to fill out the evaluations. They will help us to make future events better. Thank you. <laughs>